is currently the Associate Dire uh, District Manager for Cooperatives Insurance, but really he's here to share with us his story of kind of his career path and what he did from being a student till now. So thanks and well, help me welcome Sean to the stage. Um, while we do that, thank you very much you guys for allowing me to come in and speak to you guys. Um, when I was walking into the school this morning, uh, I really got a feeling of kind of fear as I went in the hallways and I smelt the smell of McEwen again and because it's been a while and midterms, finals, group projects, uh, entrepreneur programs started rushing through my mind and I started thinking, oh wait a second, that's not for me. Uh, probably for you guys, you have a lot of those projects and uh, I know how stressful that can be. So today I'm just going to talk a little bit about my career, who I am, and hopefully maybe I can share one thing with you guys that I've learned through my degree at McEwen. And if anything, maybe you can just listen to my story if you don't learn anything. But uh, I hope we can share one thing. Now, before I really get going to uh, my story, I just want to talk about McEwen and really why I, I really truly like this institution. And I really think it's McEwen has an identity. And I really saw that identity while I was at the school. And to me, McEwen represents a place where students can come together with faculty and other stakeholders and alumni, and everyone can really come together to work together and collaborate. And we really create students who come to school, turn into learners, then turn into educators in some capacity, and then hopefully turn into our business leaders for both the business world and our communities. And really, I think that's the identity that McEwen has, and I'm really, really proud to be part of that. Um, so thanks, Leo, for the introduction. And again, my name's Sean Maslick. So, um, Today, I'm going to share my story. So I, um, I graduated high school in 2003, and I lived in a small town just outside of Edmonton called Mournville, Alberta. I don't know if anyone, yeah, you know where Mournville is? Um, so when I graduated high school, I was 17 years old, and like most 17-year-olds, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I grew up. Um, I still haven't grown up, so I still don't know what I want to do, but uh, at that time, I decided the best thing was to do was to work at this sand plant. It seemed quite exciting. I was getting paid quite well. And I also wanted to play hockey because I, I played a lot of hockey growing up. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to work at the sand plant. I'm going to play hockey. And I might try this traveling thing because uh, it looked quite fun. After the year went by, I realized three things. I wasn't going to make the NHL. I didn't like putting sand in bags for a living. And I kind of liked traveling. So I decided, decided I need to do something else with my life. I made a checklist. And on that checklist was to go to university. I googled universities in Edmonton, came up with the University of Alberta, Grant McEwen. I picked Grant McEwen just by fluke. And um, as I'll tell you, that turned out to be a really good thing. But so I went and stumbled my way through the enrollment process. And then when it asked me, what program do you want to take? I thought, oh, that's another decision I got to make. How about commerce? I thought that was a safe bet. I didn't have to commit to being a nurse or a teacher or an engineer. It was kind of vague. So I thought, yeah, I'm going to do that. So I enrolled with Commerce. I thought it was great. And also, the idea of sitting in a corner office wearing a tie, a suit, was kind of appealing at that time. So I thought, this is a good decision. Now, unfortunately, the Commerce Department didn't really think it was a good decision. They didn't really like my high school marks. They said, well, we'll let you into McEwen, but you've got to go into Arts, and then you can transfer into Commerce if you do well. So I thought, OK, fine. So I went into Arts. And my first year of university, I went, I was quite eager. I walked right into that school. I was so excited. I thought, I'm going to university. I'll make my parents proud. And then I had my first assignment that really just cut down all my confidence. It was my English assignment. Does anyone remember English? 106, I think it's called. I had to do an essay. And in high school, I actually did quite well on, in English. And I worked hard on this essay. I, checked all my grammar, made sure it all made sense, created a beautiful theme, and handed that paper in. And a few weeks later, when I got it back, I was so excited, the teacher handed me back my paper. And I looked at it, and 60%, 60%. I was so angry. I worked so hard on that thing. In high school, I was getting 80, 90 in English, because that was my strong subject, and 60%. So I thought, geez, this university thing is a little tougher than I thought. Maybe there's some validity, but why they didn't let me into commerce. Um, and then uh, for the rest of the year, it was a struggle. I remember, actually, it was really after this class. I walked, after getting 60%, I walked into my pre-calculus class. Did anyone take pre-calculus? That's for the people who couldn't get into regular calculus at first. And uh, I took that. 
and I remember opening up my exam, and I looked at this thing, I thought, well, what language is this? What do these symbols mean? What is this? And it was, it was awful. I kind of stumbled my way through the entire exam, and I remember closing it up, giving it to my teacher. I finished it. I didn't know what I was doing, but I finished it. And then I walked over to the office of the register and withdrew from the class. I knew I couldn't do that. It was my first year. I didn't want to bother with that. Um, I actually withdrew from it two more times. In my final semester, I finally passed that course with the help of a tutor. So calculus was a struggle for me. And, uh, but the good thing was is I did pass it. Now, after my first year, I realized that, okay, now I need to get a job. I, I had this fun time at McHugh in my first year. I was learning a lot of interesting things, met a lot of people, but it was time to get a real job. I had never had a real job to this point outside of my sand plant experience. So the $34 in my bank account at that time wasn't going to last all summer, let alone pay for university the next year. And for some reason, I set this goal that I didn't want to have any student debt, so I knew I had to work, start working right away. In my small town, we were fortunate to have this summer program where university students would come back to our town and we'd cut grass and do various labor jobs for the city. It was quite fun. You got paid well, and you got to socialize with other university students. So three of my friends and I, we all applied for this job. I was in relatively good shape. I thought, oh, for sure I can get this job. So I went in for the interview, and to my surprise, the old cranky rink attendant was doing the interview. I thought, how did you go from Zamboning to interviewing for summer jobs? And now there's a bit of a backstory to this, because when I grew up, I, I loved hockey. I lived at the hockey rink. I would always bounce my, or a ball on my hockey stick before a game to warm my hands up. I did that for about 10 years, and he hated it. He thought that it was going to wreck the arena because the ball can go flying and maybe on the rink, but I knew it was just going to stay on my stick, and I really didn't see anything bad about it, so I did it for 10 years, and him and I fought for 10 years. Or not fought, but didn't get along. And now he's sitting in front of me, interviewing me for the summer job. Well, it's safe to say I did not get the job. My three friends got the job, and I felt <laughs> this was not fair, but I needed a job. So um, I went and got another job. I actually stacked tires on top of each other out of a 52-foot trailer for eight hours a day. It wasn't very fun, but it actually paid well. But it still didn't sit right with me that I didn't get that job because I really felt that I was, I was wrong. I felt like I was qualified, and I really thought it was personal. So I did what anyone would do at that time, and I called the mayor. And I couldn't talk to the mayor right away. I talked to his assistant, and I said, I, I have an issue. I have been wronged. I need to talk to the mayor. They asked <laughs> what was wrong, and I told her. She's like, oh, okay, I'll get his assistant to give you a call back. And I didn't get a call back. So I called eight more times and finally got an interview, or not an interview, a meeting with the mayor. I told him the situation. I said, this is not fair. I am qualified for this job. And two weeks later, I got a call from the town of Morinville, and they said, hey, would you be interested in a summer's position? <laughs> so I said, yeah, of course I would be. <laughs> Um, so that was my first summer. And then it was back to school. Um, for the next two, three years, I felt like this was me for a long time. I was reading. I was trying to be so diligent in my studies. And I was enjoying my studies, the organization behavior courses, our leadership courses, uh, change management courses. All these courses were quite interesting. But kind of like this guy looks a little puzzled, I was thinking, why am I doing this? Like, OK, I'm learning all this really good information, but what can I do with it? Again, as I said, I'm not going to be a teacher. I'm not going to be a nurse. I'm not something that is, like I know as soon as I graduate, I'm that. I'm this commerce student, because I did get into the commerce program at that point. And I know that I was talking to Gord right before I came out here, and he was sharing with me, because I did take Business 201, which was a lot different back then, as we were kind of, well, not a lot different, but I understand there's an entrepreneur spirit to it now, where you guys create your own business and actually feel what it's like to start a business. I think this is incredible. Uh, we did have that, but it was on a much scaled down version where we had to come up with a business. It was kind of, um, we filled in the blanks on the business. But I remember at that time really thinking, I don't know, I don't really want to participate in this. Like, uh, I, I just want to go learn, I want to go play hockey, I want to go try to travel. And I honestly didn't participate as much as I should. Um, part of it was I was incredibly shy. And I remember I was having to do a presentation for my business 201 project. I feared it. I actually, about three weeks before my presentation, thought about, I wonder if it's easier just to withdraw from university than talk in front of everyone. And uh, I decided not to, mustered up enough courage, 
And I did my portion, because it was a group project, of my presentation, and I, I am not lying. I stood there and thought it would be easier just to mumble everything so no one could hear me and stare at the ground and my armpits sweat like crazy. I sat there and I was like, is this is, and then walked back to my table and I was like, phew, it's done. But looking back to that, I just thought, why, why didn't I just embrace that opportunity? And it's, it's such a good thing to do, create a business. We're all here in commerce, which is business. Some of us might go and start our own companies. Some of us might go work for an organization. But the idea of having that self-motivation is universal in both, both directions you take. So I would definitely say embrace this class. It sounds like a fantastic class. I'm actually kind of jealous and maybe I could enroll in the class and learn something. But so the rest of my year, like I said, I felt like I was, uh, oh, that was me before uh, doing my presentation. Um, then my university took a detour. I was still uh, enrolled, I was in my final year actually, and I kept having this idea of how vast the world was and how big it was. Anyone here have done any traveling? You enjoy it? Uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. And at that point, I had done a little bit of traveling, but I thought, you know what, this is consuming me. Especially the thought that there's seven billion people in the world. And in my direct network, or sorry, indirect network, I probably knew seven to three to seven thousand of those people. That is not much. So at that time, my girlfriend and I, we decided to put our whole university on hold. I had one semester left, and I remember one of my professors saying, you are crazy, you're not gonna finish it. You're gonna go traveling, you're gonna enjoy it, you're gonna find a girl and move somewhere in the world. I was like, well, I need to finish. I already have a girlfriend, so no, that won't happen to me. So my wife and I, we went, um, we put our university on hold, we worked for six months. We had a goal of traveling around the entire world. Our goal was to start in Vancouver and circumference the entire world and come back to Nova Scotia. My grandparents lived in Vancouver, hers lived in Nova Scotia. We thought we'd take the long way to get there. And uh, we worked for six months, 80 hours a day. We went in construction, which was kind of out of both of our realms. But I remember setting ourselves a goal. We need to have this much money by six months. It equated to saving 95% of our, any money we made. And we did it, and we made this trip, and we actually circumferenced the entire world in a year. It was amazing, and we learned a lot about ourselves. Um, that's us on top of a volcano in Bali, Indonesia. Um, here we volunteered for a few weeks in Nepal at an orphanage. Now, traveling is amazing for many reasons, but something that I've really learned from it, and it doesn't have to come from traveling around the world, traveling uh, internationally, just about having new experiences, is it really changes your lens or your perspective on life. And something that I will take away from this trip, which has influenced and made a bit of a tiny little transformation into me that's a lifelong journey, is that I'm becoming more and more grateful for what I have. I'm grateful for the fact that I can come to university, come here today, I enjoy this. And I'm grateful for the fact that I get that because a vast majority of our world and 95% of our travels in third world countries where basic necessities aren't a luxury and not available to everyone. I realize that I, born in Canada, born to a good family, literally have won a lottery. The lottery of life, about 0.3% of the population has the opportunity to be born like we do, or like myself in Canada. And what this really did to me was to recognize opportunities and be grateful for them because not everyone is able to get the opportunities that I get, so I felt it was my obligation to recognize these opportunities and really embrace them and take advantage of them. So that's something that really is still stuck with me is when I see an opportunity, I'm grateful for it and I know that I need to take advantage of this because not everyone does or gets that opportunity. Now, after traveling, I went back to university, um, took another class with Gord, and it was great business 450. Uh, we did a lot more presentations, started practicing that skill, and then I graduated. And it was time to get a job. I thought, well, this is the easy part. Four years of university, well, it ended up being five because I took a year off. And I had this big, shiny McEwen degree from a university. While I was gone, the college turned into a university, which was great, and I now have a university degree instead of a college degree, so that was good. So I thought I'd be able to get a job, no problem. About four months later, I still had no job. Um, I started getting worried. I thought, hey, I have a management degree. How do I not have a job? And I started noticing all these management positions that I'm applying for is five, 10, 15 years of experience needed. And I was thinking, wow, how, this doesn't make sense. What am I gonna do with myself? I'm a lost cause. Um, 
And one day I was looking at my emails, sent emails for resumes. I sent out 125 resumes. 125 tailored resumes. I wasn't just mass sending out resumes. I was actually looking at the company, looking at the description of the job, and tailoring my resume. No one wanted me. I, I couldn't figure out why. After about 100 resumes, I started really branching out after that on the 25. Uh, I got a phone call from uh, Senior Center on Jasper Ave. It was for a cooking position. I was really broadening out my perspective. I thought maybe I could start cooking really well and then I can manage the cooks. I was just trying to force in my degree somewhere. And um, I remember preparing for this interview, went through behavioral interview questions, Googled them online, how to prep for that, walked with my nice little duetang and my uh, resume and cover letter, and the hiring manager sat me down in the, in the like, kitchen area. Not the actual kitchen, but the dining room area. And I thought, well, it's a little odd, but okay, we'll do our interview here. And he asked me two questions. Will you be late? And do you know how to cook? Uh, though I didn't study those questions, but I answered them the best as I can. And I remember being interrupted by this lady. And she walked in, and she's like, I want turkey. <laughs> kind of threw me off my train of thought when I was doing my interview. And I remember sitting there thinking, I have a degree. I can't get a job, and I can't even get this job because this doesn't seem like it's going well. And I walked out of there quite discouraged, and I didn't get the job. I actually got a phone call back saying, you don't, sorry, uh, you're not successful. We actually think you're overqualified. I think overqualified. I'm jobless. It's been four months, and I just have this degree that's not doing anything for me. So I kept looking on the Internet, trying to find some things that I could apply. Then an opportunity came, and as I talked to you about before, I really started embracing opportunities. And I think that we all need to recognize our opportunities, and opportunities only get us so far, it's what we do with that opportunity. And my girlfriend's mom knew someone who was hiring in the insurance industry. I thought, okay, perfect, I'll apply for that. I got an interview, I had no idea about insurance. My parents had been paying my insurance my whole university. I didn't know anything about it. But I, I studied the insurance industry. I read and read and read in preparation for that interview. And apparently it went well because I got the job. It was March 14, 2010 was my first real full-time job with my degree. Um, and I really felt that you know, I was grateful for that. So I practiced um, our policy wordings as an adjuster, really learned how to adjust claims. And that went on for about three months. And then another opportunity came. I heard through the grapevine that the cooperator's insurance, who's my current employer, um, was hiring another position that was kind of a step up, more in the investigation of insurance claims. I thought, that'd be great. And I happened to know someone who worked there, and I said, hey, do you know the, who's hiring this position? And it ended up they did. I got an interview, and again, practiced, read the cooperator's mission statement. What is his vision? What does the company actually believe in? And I tailored my interview presentation around that. I was lucky. I got the job, and that job was great. Um, I remember after about three months, I finally finished my training, and then something great happened. My manager quit. I thought, oh, this is perfect. A manager quit? I have a Bachelor of Commerce in Management. I'm applying for that role. So when the posting came out, uh, I looked at the credentials, and the criteria was experience in organi organization behavior, change management, um, human resources, leadership. I was like, oh, perfect, this is everything I took in the school. I thought the world was aligning for me to take this management position. I was gonna be a manager, just fresh out of high, or, uh, university. I applied for the job, got the interview, again, practiced and practiced and practiced for my interview. Was successful enough to go to the second interviews where they sent me to Calgary, and again, I'm thinking, I got the job, this is perfect, they're sending me to Calgary, how many people could they send to Calgary? It's expensive. So I went down there, I actually had to do a presentation in front of the regional claims manager, and uh, I thought it went so well. I came home, told my girlfriend, that I was like, I'm gonna get this job, it's so good. They were smiling, they were liking it. And then I got a phone call and, hi Sean, this is so for um, so cooperators, unfortunately you weren't successful. <laughs> oh my God, my world is collapsing, I'm done. I will never get a management job. I was still about six months out of my degree. Uh, well, plus the four months I was unemployed, so about 10 months. I shouldn't have got that job. It required 10 years of insurance experience, five years of management, but it was a phenomenal experience. And then just fast forward a little bit. From that, someone had heard that I applied for that job on the sales side. So in insurance, you can be an adjuster or you can be on the sales side or the advisor side. And they asked me, hey, you have a commerce degree. So now my commerce degree is coming in handy for me. Would you be interested in maybe running your own business? I thought, well, of course I would. That's why I went to school. And, um, 
he said, why don't you come on the sales side? If you do well, you could potentially own your own cooperator's office. So I thought, this is fantastic. Went to the sales side, did, did very well. For two years, our office performed better than it ever had. And then he approached me and said, so Sean, when do you think you're ready to own your own cooperator's office? And I thought, oh my God, this is happening. I can own my own office. I can have nice shoes. I can make good money. It's a very sexy role that I'm going to be an owner of my own business. And uh, I thought, oh, break today, today. When do you want me to start? And then I remember going home and something just wasn't feeling right. I had a gut feeling that, ah, is this really what you want to do, Sean? And then my brain kept saying, of course you do. You want to be a business owner. You want to be the boss. And uh, then my gut kept saying, I don't know, Sean. Is this right? And I was actually conflicted. And I had actually weeks of restless nights. And actually, I ran into Gord at uh, Shoppers Drug or London Drugs in Oliver Square. And I remember telling him that. And uh, I decided to leave the company. It was a it's a great company. I decided to leave. I need I couldn't I just didn't feel right. And I went to a job that certainly was not for me. That didn't last very long. But what it did, it got me. A, it gave me an opportunity to have some clarity and to think about really what I want. And it just happened to be lucky that I stumbled across a book. It, and if you don't download it or buy it, that's okay. But just write it down. It's called Start with Why. Um, the author is Simon Sinek, and he really talks about. He looks at inspirational leaders, inspirational companies. Uh, companies that are really being innovated and pushing the way, and how they really, really understand why they do what they do before they actually understand how or what they do. So for me, I was stuck in this outer circle of what I want to do. I want to be a boss. I want to have a sexy role. How was I going to do that? I was going to sell insurance. And I really felt at that time that's what the confliction was in my gut or my intuition, is that that wasn't true to who I was. And what Simon talks about in his book is the people who really understand why they do what they do. What craft do they have and how are they going to give that to the world? They're the ones who can become inspirational. And they're the ones that can become really successful. And at that point, um, their power is endless. So uh, for me, at that time, I realized that my why, and to this day, this is still what I aspire to do, is to, uh, to inspire others to achieve their greatest potential. That's what I want to do. And that's why I have a career. That's why I like going to work every day. As a result, I get to work with financial planning and insurance. But really, why? It's because I want to help people achieve their fullest potential. So with that in mind, I thought, OK, how can I do this? I need to get out of this current job that I went into, because it was not good. I kept going back to cooperators. I was thinking, I can really do that at the cooperators. You know what? That was a very terrible decision to leave that company. And I kind of felt like old Donald here in this picture. What did I do? I had a great job. This company was amazing to me. And I just walked away. So I called up my district manager. And I said, I'm sorry. But I think I want to come back. I'm ready. And he kind of chuckled and said, OK, we actually have a business owner position right now. Put a business plan together, apply for it, and let's see what you do. I ended up finally getting the job. He offered me the job. And then something strange happened in the interview. There's the district manager and the associate district manager. I always was jealous of these district manager and associate district manager job. Never thought I would be able to have that job. But they told me that the associate district manager was uh, moving on to another company. And I thought, oh, that's actually the job I really want. So here I was. I left the company, came back to them with a the tail between my legs, saying, please let me have another chance. They do about four interviews with me. They give me the job. And I actually said, you know what? I actually want that job. And they both looked at me like, what? So they let me apply. I applied. I went through the interviews and the presentations that are involved. And I got the job. And that's the job I have now. So my role is an associate district manager for the cooperators insurance. And I actually absolutely love my job. I'm not putting a plug in for the cooperators at all. But for myself, I get to live out that, that why of helping people live to their greatest potential. And so for myself, I get to motivate, inspire, and manage a group of 27 business owners who indirectly have 140 staff. So that Bachelor of Commerce degree in management, uh, I keep looking at it and think, wow, I never thought this would, do, this would come. But it did. And you know, I really was persistent and kept taking advantage of these opportunities. But um, so. That's where I am now. I, I actually truly, truly enjoy my job. I love going to work every single day. And uh, 
Before I wrap up, these are key takeaways for myself that I've learned through my university and my early career. The first one is past experiences. Our past experiences, they systematically create the fabric of who we are. Our experiences create who we are. So everything that we're doing right now, we're creating our future. So I'm always a big believer now to live life to its fullest, experience everything. If you want to try something, go and do it. Two things are going to happen. You're either going to succeed at it, you're going to fail. When you succeed, don't get too overconfident. Recognize how you succeeded and then see how that can be, like continue to improve yourself. If you fail, don't get mad. Don't get mad at all. Um, just learn how you can do better next time. So learn from your experiences. They shape your future. Um, find your why. I know I said write that book down. Seriously, write it down twice if you have to so you don't forget. This book is amazing. It, it talks a lot about what makes your heart sing. What do you want? You guys all have an amazing ability, deep, some, somehow deep inside of you. It's when we really discover that, that we can become powerful and let the world see our craft. And at that point, we're engaged in our work. Work isn't work anymore. We're fulfilled, and we have a lot of engagement in our, in our roles. We're going to be working for a long time. So the sooner we can find our why, the better. Embrace adversity. Adversity is going to happen no matter what. Every single person faces adversity. But it's how people deal with adversity that makes them different. When we're faced with adversity, we have two decisions. We can either fall to it and just realize, ah, oh, that's my luck. That's my luck, man. I can't do anything about it. Or I can embrace it, and I can learn from it, and I can think like, OK, in spite of this, I am going to do that. So embrace adversity. It will make you stronger. It absolutely will. If I didn't challenge the town of Mournville, and if I didn't tell them that, hey, I don't agree with this, that's facing adversity, um, I wouldn't have worked in that job that summer. I wouldn't have met my girlfriend, who I ended up marrying, who we're expecting our first kid next week. So embrace adversity. You never know what it can do with you, for you. Practice gratitude. Gratitude is something that, if you can practice on a daily basis how to be grateful, you will be happier, which will transfer into people enjoying being around you more, be more engaged at your work, and attracting more people. Something that uh, I've taken, and it was from a conference that I went to, was practicing three things of gratitude every day. You spend five, maximum five minutes a day, and just think about things you're gra grateful for. They could be as silly as a cup of coffee. But I tell you, when you drink that cup of coffee, it's going to taste so much better. And again, you're going to enjoy and be more grateful in your lifetime. So really, be grateful. And be grateful for opportunities and take advantage of them. Second last one, keep learning. Now, McEwen University was one of the best things I've ever done. The technical things I learned from organization behavior, change management, human resources, leadership, I honestly use those every day. I find it amazing how often something trickles in that I completely forgot that I was learning. Especially when I was learning that, I thought, how am I ever going to use this? This has no relevance in my life. But honestly, everything you're learning here will come back someday. And you will learn it. But beyond the technical skills, the thing that McEwen taught me the most is how to be a lifelong learner. And that's something that I feel has really helped me in my career. Since I graduated from McEwen, I've taken an insurance designation. I've taken a financial advising designation. Um, I have numerous courses I read all the time. And it's because McEwen has created my mind to think, I want to learn. And when you learn, or when you read and expand your mind, honestly, the, our, the opportunities are endless. So in class, I know it gets, sorry, sometimes boring. It could, be, it could seem boring, not boring, but you might be tired, you might be studying. Just be present. Learn, take advantage of your opportunities. I talked about opportunities earlier. You have a great opportunity in this class. I wish that we had that back then. It would be amazing. Honestly, I would like to start a company someday. And it would have been so neat to actually try it in, uh, in McEwen in a safe zone. So just really be present and take advantage of the knowledge you're learning here. Last one, time is limited. Don't let anyone create your destiny. Don't, don't let anyone. Don't let anyone tell you what to do. Don't let anyone tell you no. If you really believe in something, if you know your why and you want to get there, don't let someone tell you no. When we create our own vision and our why, our intuition, our intuition is incredibly strong and it will guide you to where you want to go. Now, you will fail. I talked about adversity. You will fall off path. 
But if you have a strong vision, a strong sense of why, your intuition, your heart will take you back to where you want to go. Now, just want to leave with one last thing. Everyone knows who Steve Jobs is. Um, he said something that really resonated with me, and it was about four words, and it was simply, stay hungry and stay foolish. And those words have always stuck with me. So I hope everyone here could stay hungry and stay foolish. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, do we have any questions for Sean from the class? One question? One question, come on. Well, I, I think um, when I was in school, I, I tried to be present. Every time that I was in class, I tried to learn. I didn't, again, like I said, I didn't know what I was going to do with that knowledge, but I was present. And I think that's, that's to answer your question. And when you do that, the craziest places in life are learning experience. You remember, oh, I remember that from change management, or I remember that from that class. So I think it's just to really be present. You're investing your time. You might as well be present. And when I say present, you know what I mean. Like, we could just be sitting here, but our brain's off doing something else. You're here, you're invested, just be present. I find that a lot of students are learning sometimes for the exam, right? They try and do this so that they can get the mark on the exam mm -hmm. rather than trying to just absorb it. And, you know, it'll sit there in your mind for a period of time. But if you just do it for the exam, it might just evaporate once the exam is over. Yeah. Right? And that's where you're not as present. I want to ask you, you know, congratulations in advance for your first child. Yeah. I think about your takeaways and I'm thinking, well, you're going to be going through this list again once your child is yeah. born and everything's going to apply again. So yeah. it's a wonderful presentation. I really appreciate uh, you sharing with us. Do you have any advice for presentations? Because you've given us a great presentation today. How did you get from that point where you were so uh, not confident and shy to what were the steps that you took? Um, I, I remembered that feeling of staring at the ground in complete hum humiliation um, in that Business 201 presentation. Now that, that didn't change it. I, throughout uh, the rest of the, the degree, you have to do various little presentations. I was still horrible. And uh, it honestly was, I watched, oh, this is takeaway, TED Talks. Does anyone know what a TED Talk is? Watch TED Talks all the time. I watched a TED Talk. I can't remember the girl's name, but it was about fake it until you make it. And when I came in, and for a lot of the interviews, I, you have to do presentations. They, they were okay, they were good, but um, when I successfully got that, uh, my current role, I started on, uh, on a Thursday, and on the Monday, I had to run a workshop on something that I had to learn over the weekend. I practiced all weekend, and I didn't want to disappoint my new employer, and I just went up there, and I remember, fake it till you make it. And I just pretended like I was acting. Honestly, that's all I did. I pretended like I was acting, and after my new employer said, hey, you're really good at presentations, and I'm, I don't know where that came from. So honestly, just try it. And I, I know that sounds like such terrible uh, suggestions, but I also thought, that looked bad, me staring at the ground. Why, how much better would it be if I just tried to be a great presenter, or not great presenter, but a good presenter where I can articulate my point across? And then I, I realized that that's a much better situation. So. Um, you can do it in front of the mirror, so, so I just think practice, embrace the opportunities. Yeah. As you, I like how you describe Mission Possible as being a, in the safe zone, right? Yeah. Class tends yeah. to be a bit of a safe zone. Right. If you make that mistake and you're kind of looking at the ground, kind of everyone understands what you're feeling. They can all relate to you, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're in, a, in an interview, you'll mm -hmm. feel a little bit more judged, a little bit more pressure. Mm -hmm. But like, even on the interview, what I've learned to now is I don't care if people judge me. Honestly, like, and that, uh, if I'm, again, going back to my wa the why, if I know what I'm doing is valuable, valuable, if I know what I'm talking about is a good thing, 
I'll take criticism. I'll take constructive, constructive criticism. But if they want to judge me in an ill way, that's to their own demise. But if I know I'm doing something that good-hearted, then uh, I, and I used to feel always judged. But okay. we have one question here. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and I think it took me years to realize that. Um, little things, and uh, I kind of talked about it, but the biggest change that I saw is I, I really understood, um, lack of better words, my privilege. Uh, just being, like I said, born here, uh, I could have been born anywhere in the world. And that's really changed my perspective and outlook on, I don't know everyone's story. I can't judge people. I don't know, I don't know your background story. And say I'm doing something and you're not, I can't judge you on that. Going back to presentations, it's not fair to me if you get up in front of here and uh, mumble and stare at the ground and have sweaty armpits too, I can't judge you being a bad presenter. I don't know if you've had a traumatic an experience that led you to there. So to answer your question, it just has changed my outlook and really allowed me to understand my privilege and embrace that. Well, thank you very much, Sean, yeah, for coming you. and revisiting the Q&A again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody.